Good morning. morning. Wake up. We're going to have to repeat that. Wake up. Repeat. Wake up. Repeat. No, okay. You're just supposed to repeat that in your own time. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the fact that it's all a gift. Your life has a lot of good, a lot of bad, a lot of ugly, all mixed in together. And what we're going to see today is that the good stuff comes from God. And that what he gives us and the things that we really need in life, they're all a gift. Now, Christmas time, we're, we're kind of ramping up. Anybody got some of your gifts already? Anybody got all your gifts ready? Bought? Yeah, I guess if you're not buying any, that it's easy to get to the end. No, I'm just kidding. All right. But right now, I mean, we have gifts that it's kind of front of mind. We got grandkids coming and stocking stuffers and, you know, all the stuff that's got to go on and we're getting ready for the holidays. But God has been busy since the beginning of time giving us gifts. Now, what he knows is this. One in two women will lie and say they like it even when they don't. So he, he knows that. So he's going to make sure that they get good gifts because he doesn't want them to lie. And just so you know, that one out of three guys will do the same. Now, does that mean that guys are more honest than women? No, it means they're less compassionate, right? So women are very compassionate. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. So they'll kind of fudge in that. But this is what God knows. He knows that one out of two women want jewelry for Christmas. One and two, you're just the other one. Okay, one and two. But one or two women want jewelry for Christmas. So some of you guys, if you've been hearing the voice of God going, a bracelet or a necklace, that's God telling you to get your wife jewelry, right? Now, for guys, one in three guys wants a gift card. How many already knew that? How many of your surprise is that low? You want to know my sons and son-in-laws are getting, my son and son-in-laws are getting for their stocking stuffer this year? A gift card. Lowe's, Home Depot, doesn't matter. Either one works just fine. Okay. One in two people, this is the one that kind of shocked me. One in two people will buy a gift for themselves. Okay, she goes, okay. Now, when asked, why are you doing that? They say this, because they deserve it. Now, this shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the word gift. A gift is something you don't deserve. Now, I blame this on Santa Claus. He started this thing of a naughty and nice list, and you have to kind of earn your gifts from him. Not the way it's supposed to be. Gifts, by definition, are something that you don't deserve. And if you don't understand that, you're going to miss a lot of today. So, in the end, not what we deserve. But, what I said starting is, it's all a gift. And this is what scripture says. Today we're going to be in 2 Peter 1, just for those that want to jump to where we're going to spend most of our time. 2 Peter 1, chapter 1 through the first 11 verses. That's where we're going to be, but let me start with a couple other verses here. James 1, 17. Whatever is good and perfect. Now, how many know we live in a broken world? But isn't there still some good and perfect things that happen in the broken world? Okay, what James wants you to realize is those don't come from the broken world. Anything that comes to you that is good and perfect in the biblical sense of the word perfect in the Greek language means fully formed. Something that's all that it should be, right? When those things come into your life, that is a gift from God. Whatever, listen, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. So even in a broken world, God is constantly gift giving. He is bringing good things into your life and for a reason, which we'll get into. John 17, 7 is a verse that we studied a few weeks back. We just finished the Gospel of John. Chapter 17 is the prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples and for all of us. But there's one little line in that prayer that I didn't really focus on, but I'm saving it for now. You ready? This is an amazing statement that he makes. He's praying to God and he says, Now they know, he's talking about the 12 disciples, they know that everything I have is a gift from you. Jesus is saying everything he has is a gift from the Father. Jesus laid down all of his rights to anything and lived his life on the gifts of God, including the Holy Spirit, which we'll get into. 
So to think that our life is any different than that would be a little presumptuous. The bottom line is our life, the good that comes to us in our life is a gift from God. Today, we're going to talk about our response to that. It's all a gift. All the stuff worth having in your life that you have is not the result of all your hard work. It's the result of gifts of God and maybe what you did with those gifts. But the bottom line is it all goes back to him. So let's pray. We'll jump in. Lord God, you are an amazing father and you know the right gifts for each one of us. You know what to give us and what to not give us. You know what will bless us and you know what will curse us. You know what will take us away from you. So, Lord, this holiday season, as we're busily buying gifts for everyone else, may we see and be aware of the gifts that you have for each and every one of us. And may that change the way we see our lives. May that change the way we live our lives. May that change who we are as people because of your constant work and activity in our life. The good gifts that you bring us are for our transformation. Help us to see that, to live that, and to be changed by that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question is, do we want what God has for us? What do you really want right now? At this season of your life, why are you here? What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you need from God? If you want what he wants for you, what did we talk about last week? The amazing life feels a lot like sacrifice. Feels a lot like living your life for other people, li living a selfless life. Most of us didn't wake up this morning and say, I can't wait to be selfless today. But if you were paying attention last week, hopefully there was at least one or two of you that said, no, that's Pastor Van said that. We're, if we live a selfless life, it will make us an amazing person. So if you want to be an amazing person, we need to, to become the person that God has for us. He calls that a godly person. It means we're just behaving like him. That's what it means to be godly. It doesn't mean you're God. It means you're behaving the way he would want you to behave, just like your heavenly father. So he gives us the ability to wake up, to be amazing, and then to repeat that every day. So first, it's all a gift. Things like what? what what's a gift? The first one's kind of amazing. It's one you'd easily miss, but that's why I'm here, so you don't miss it. First half of the first verse, the first gift that God wants to give you is each other. The, the text is literally talking about Peter and his leadership. How many think Peter was an amazing person? Yeah. Now, in the beginning, was he amazing? No, he was kind of a goofball. I mean, he was saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, getting in trouble, all of that. But in time, he becomes the leader of the early church. He is just this amazing person and amazing leader. So as he talks about himself, this is what he says. He's just introducing his letter. By the way, this is his second letter. This he is writing as he is preparing to die. As far as we know, he died under the reign of Nero and was, was, was martyred. And he knows his, his time is limited. This is his last chance to communicate with his people, including us. And this is what he says. Verse 1. This letter is from Simon Peter. Now, the Gospel of Mark is pretty much from Simon too, but Mark wrote it. Simon Peter was the informant, okay? But that, again, he's a fisherman. He's not a writer, right? But this is his letter. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't sound amazing. I guess saying you're an apostle, that sounds pretty amazing, but saying you're a slave, is that amazing? I already gave you the hint from last week if you live a selfless life, the more selfless you are, the more amazing you are. Is there anybody more selfless than a slave? A slave lives completely for the welfare of his master. He says that first. And in the Greek language, you always say the most important thing first. He says, I am a slave of Jesus and I'm an apostle. Now, what do we know that's true of people that are apostles? Ephesians 4.11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave the church. So God gives you gifts, but he also gives the church as a whole gifts. They are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. 
So, bottom line, people are gifts. God wants to give you a gift this Christmas of other people in your life that build you up in Jesus. And are you ready for this? Probably more importantly, he wants to give you as a gift to the people in your life. The first gift that Peter talks about, really, you would just go right by it. If you just say, well, he's just introducing the book. He's not saying anything. No, he's saying volumes. His life, the reason he's amazing is he has been a gift to the early church and to us. And he's getting ready to finish that race. And as an apostle, a recognized gift to the church. So there's a guy named Casey Graham. And he said something cool, so I'm using him because he said something cool. I really don't know who he is. He's the CEO of Gravy. How many like Gravy? I don't think they actually make Gravy. I think that's just what they call their company. So you'll have to look it up. But he has a, a saying that he says with his employees that I really, really like. And he just says this, and they do this all the time. It's a part of their culture. Say what you see. Say what you see. Now, what does he mean by that? When, when somebody in his company sees somebody else doing it the way they're supposed to be doing it, they talk about it. They say what they see. They encourage those. They build others up who are doing it the way that company wants it to be done. So this is what I'm calling us to do over the next couple months, is we're doing this series. And again, we'll go in and out because of Christmas, but we'll, we'll continue on in January. As we do, I want you to say what you see. Now, how many of you have a smartphone? If you have it, go ahead, hold it up. You probably have it out just in case something important happens. While you, the ones that raise their hands quickly, we know they're addicted. Okay. Okay. Now, same, same group. How many know how to take a video of yourself on that phone? Go ahead. Put your hands up. Okay. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you, when somebody comes to mind that does something amazing because they're being like Jesus, they do something amazing because they're living their life for others and not just for themselves. When you see something amazing, I want you to talk about it. So make a one-minute video. I don't care. Post it online. Send it to them. But please send it to me. My email is van at vistachurch.com. Okay, we know this. It's not hard. Go, What's your email? Guys, van at vistachurch.com. So they also say, is van short for anything? It's actually short for Vanessa but I wasn't a girl. So that's the way that goes. Okay. If I'd have been a girl, I'd have been a Vanessa. Okay. Well, they ask, and I can't not tell them the truth. Well, yeah, it's short for Vanessa. But anyway, I was named after my grandmother. All right. I want you to make a one-minute video, send it to me, and, and honor that person that has been a gift in your life. As I was sharing this with my wife, my wife says, it's not going to happen. And I go, well, why not? And she goes, well, one, everybody will forget. We will walk away from church this morning and we will just forget. Good idea, we just will forget. But the other thing is, she goes, I, I just don't, uh, who would you do it about? And I said, you have dozens of people in your life that you could do this for. And she goes, no, I don't. And I said, your Sunday school teachers, our shepherds, the women that help you with women's ministry. I went over two dozen right there. And she goes, you're right. There are all kinds of people in your life, and you're supposed to say what you see. I hope that will sink in. Say what you see. When you see amazing behavior in a brother or sister in Jesus, let them know it's amazing. Now, do I have to send them a video? No. But for some of you, that's easier than actually, easier than actually talking to them. I'll just send them a video. But, but just do it. Say what you see. All right. So if Amazon comes to your front door and they leave a gift and you leave it there for any period of time, somebody else is going to enjoy it. So please answer your door, get your gift. But what are the first two questions you ask? We do this in Reengage all the time. What are the two questions you ask when you get a gift at your door? What is it and who's it from? Right? What is it? Who's it from? The reason you ask what is it is because you have ordered so many things by Amazon, you don't know what it is. And if it's from you, you expected that. But if it turns out to not be from you, you want to know who it's from. Now, we talk about that in re-engage because your spouse is a gift to you from God. People are gifts. And if you realize your spouse is a gift from God, 
If nothing else, the fact that God gave you that gift should make it more precious to you, right? Same thing with us. The people in our lives are gift to, gifts to us from God. And we need to enjoy them. And we need to say what we see. All right. First, it's all a gift, but he starts out talking about people, leaders. And then second, he talks about heart things, right? He talks about faith and grace and peace. Faith is our open heart toward God. Grace, and specifically the grace by which we are saved, is God's open heart toward us. And peace is what happens when those first two come together. When God's open heart toward us is met by our open heart toward God, it is, that is what generates salvation. And then the result of that is peace. But all heart issues. The point is there are a lot of intangible things that God gives you. And when you see peace in your life, as an example, you need to say what you see. You need to say, God, thank you. How many know there's at least one or two reasons not to have peace in your heart right now? Okay, good. You don't watch TV. All right. The bottom line is there's a lot of screwy stuff going on. But we can still have peace no matter how screwy it all gets. So back to verse 1. We're not even done with verse 1 yet. Okay, we'll get done before tomorrow. All right. I am writing to you to share the same precious faith. I love the way he says that. How many of us see our faith, the faith that we possess, as precious, as highly valuable? Who share the same precious faith that we have. So he's talking to other believers who have the same saving faith that he has, and he's calling it precious. Again, a precious gift from God. This faith was given to you because you deserve it. No, that's never the reason you get a gift. Now, I love what it says. What it says is so far better than that. The faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. How many were told that life's not fair? How many know life's not fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's where your parents left it. And you've been sad ever since. <laughs> Life is not fair. It's broken. And there's no fairness into the way that it transpires. There's no fairness. But who is fair? Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is fair. Whoa. That should make you feel better. That may be the whole reason you're here today. Just so you can go home feel good about the fact that God is fair. The justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Verse 2, finally. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So what's he saying? Wake up. Be amazing. Repeat. He wants to give it to you more and more. That every day as you live your life, you have more and more heart needs met. Your open heart, your peace of heart, all that, that's going on in your heart, God wants to make it better and better. Which very much echoes what Paul says in uh, Ephesians 2.8. God saved you by his grace, by his open heart toward you. When you believed, when you had your open heart toward him, he decided that's the way salvation would work. And you can't take credit for this. It is a what? It's a gift from God. We didn't get to decide how this all works. He did. And he gave it to us as a gift. So, gifts are oftentimes intangible heart things. What else? It's all a gift. And, and this is, um, I'd never thought of it this way before. But God's promises to us, his amazing promises to us, are a massive gift with a huge return. Verse 3. By his divine power, and, and this word for power is dunamis, is where we get dynamite or dynamo or just, it means a lot of power. You know, almost explosive power, massive power. 
God's massive, his divine massive power. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. So this morning, if you don't know him, all this stuff that we're talking about is still kind of just out of reach. Where this becomes something that's actually yours is you come to know him. You have to know him. And then the promises of God are promises for you. We receive all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. His amazing, to use our word, glory and excellence. Glory is the manifest substantive presence of God. That as God shows up, his, just his sustenance, his, uh, his being is so weighty. And that, that weightiness and that excellence is what draws us to him. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given to us great and precious promises. These promises are huge and they're invaluable. You, you can't buy these promises. They are amazing. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Oh, my word. I would love to tell you that's hyperbole. It's not, which means exaggeration. It's not. The promises of God are what empower you to be amazing, to be like Jesus. And he makes them all the time. Quick disclaimer. Anybody ever had a little book of promises, God's promises in a book? Yeah, they typically have about half of them from Proverbs. Proverbs aren't promises. Proverbs are just stating what normally happens, right? So if something doesn't happen the way it says in Proverbs, you're the exception to the rule, but that's what that is. But the promises of God are massive, and we'll have some before we're done today in this text, right? And they're what empower us to live the amazing life he's calling us to live. So not, not small in any way, shape, or form. These great and precious promises, these are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires, which is the number one reason you don't believe that he actually wants you to share in his nature because of the level of corruption that is all around you and possibly in you. But it's these same promises that overcome that corruption, then freeing you to be the amazing people God wants you to be. The way we frame life, the way we see it, the paradigm that we have, the, the lens or the frame that we have that, that we see life through, does that affect the way we live our lives? Does that shape our behavior and our attitudes and, and all that we do? Does it not come from what we see? So if nothing else, this message today is to say, wake up. See what God is doing in your life. See the gifts of God that he is giving you because that will change how you live your life. It'll change what you think is possible. But if you don't see it, you miss out, which is, that's why you say what you see, because other people in your life may not be seeing in the moment what you're seeing. And when you say it, then they see it too, right? So you're, you're sharing the good stuff. Okay, Ohio State beat Michigan State yesterday. And everybody thought they should because they're a better team. But I guess their coach got COVID, and so a whole bunch of their players were in isolation. And at the beginning of the game, they really weren't sure if they were going to win the game or not. Is that the way the Ohio State players took that? No, they're not sitting around going, oh, man, all we can see is the fact that our coach isn't here and a bunch of our players aren't here. No, they see themselves as national champs. May be debatable, but that's the way they see themselves. So how did they play? Yeah, they played like national champs. Now you're going, are you sad? Because it was Michigan State. Michigan State, the green team, not the blue team. So, no, it doesn't bother me at all. Matter of fact, my number two favorite team is Ohio State. I was born in Ohio. Okay. Anyway, okay. But how we frame life, how we see it, has everything to do with how we behave and how we live. 1 John 5.20. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and he is eternal life. Jesus was promised to us before we received him. Throughout the Old Testament, Jesus is promised to us, and then he came. He is one of the promises of God that changes everything. Back up in 1 John 4, it says, And God has given us his spirit as proof that we can live in him and he in us. The Holy Spirit was promised both in the Old Testament and before Jesus left. He said, hang out in Jerusalem because I got a gift for you. And it is that Holy Spirit that empowers us to live the life that God called us to live. It is the gift of Jesus at Christmas time that is the gift. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit that drives that home and makes it real in our heart and in our lives. So it's all a gift. The people, the faith, the grace, the uh, peace, the promises, all of that are gifts from God. And then if there was anything that we could possibly miss, let's just go back to verse 3 where it says, everything we need is a gift. Everything we need. That is just overwhelming. How many, okay, don't raise your hand. But in your heart of hearts, you think you really have more needs than what God can handle. Or you're concerned that some of the things you think you need, he doesn't think you need. So it's like, ah, I just, I want that too. But he wants you to be amazing. And he knows everything you need to be amazing. Verse 3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life life. He's all in. The question is, are we? Verse 5. I love this because he kind of gives us a checklist. In Reengage, I made one of these for um, kind of a married relationship on um, just kind of the couple's attraction to each other and all these different, I think it was about a dozen things that, you know, if you do these things, then it will really raise your desire for each other, right? And it's a great little list because if at some point in the list you go, oh, I'm missing that, that's not the thing you need to work on. It's the thing before that that you need to work on that produces that. And he gives us a list just like that here. He's going to say, here's the things you need, and I'm just going to say the same thing. If any one of them you go, well, I don't have self-control. I'm going to work on self-control. How many have done that before? I am working really hard on self-control, and it is not working. Well, just back up to the thing before it, because without that thing, your self-control is worthless. It just doesn't work. Okay, let's, here's his checklist. Hopefully this is helpful. He's trying to be helpful. Verse 5. In view of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. That is a huge sentence. Don't, don't take this lightly. Make every effort to respond to the promises of God. What good is a promise if you don't respond to it? What good is a check if you don't cash it? Anybody ever kept a check just for sentimental reasons and you just didn't cash it because you just had more sentimental reasons than you needed the money? No, you cash the thing. Anybody here, you know, there's the gift on your front door that Amazon left, but you're just going to leave it there because you don't really need to open it, so you're just going to leave it there. Somebody else will come and open it, right? So the point is we have to make every effort to respond to these promises. Supplement. How many took supplements this morning? Okay, we used to have breakfast, now we just have supplements. <laughs> there are so many pills. We have the pills we take with water a half hour before we eat, and when we eat, it's the other supplements we can take with food, and they're pretty much it. Okay, so we understand supplement, right? What we're supposed to supplement here is our faith. It is by God's grace, his open heart to us, that we open our hearts to him, that's our faith, and that's what triggers our salvation. But what he's saying here is don't stop there. You need to supplement that faith, that precious faith, with a whole bunch of other stuff if you're going to be amazing. So here's your amazing response checklist. Okay. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. How many already feel like you're overwhelmed? Really? We're going to start with moral excellence? 
if you're not committed to stopping the, you've heard me talk in the past about cutting corners, bad idea. Spiritually, cutting corners, bad idea. You've got to set that aside and say, I don't want a quick fix faith. I want the substantial real deal. Okay, so you need to have moral excellence, which means you give yourself to, I'm going to become this person. It's a commitment to becoming this person God wants you to be. And if you're still cutting corners, all the rest of it doesn't work because you need that devotion to moral excellence, a generous provision of moral excellence. And then to moral excellence, you add knowledge. How many think knowledge is important? I was talking to somebody on the phone yesterday, and they're getting ready to, to get some financing for their house. And it's like, they're talking about it. And I said, well, talk to the bank. And they go, don't you think it's too soon to talk to the bank? And I go, is it ever too soon to have knowledge? Knowledge is a good thing. You may not be ready, but you need knowledge, and they have it. Right? So knowledge, not bad. Now, you could have knowledge, and God could still lead you in a direction that you know, doesn't completely line up with that knowledge. That's God. He can do that. But knowledge by itself is never a bad thing. So to your moral excellence, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. Now, we're going to study the fruit of the Spirit as we get to the end of this series. The last Sunday, we'll talk about the last three fruit of the Spirit, and the last one is self-control. How many know self-control is, like, critically important for all of this? If your life is out of control, you're just, I mean, it's not working, right? So to your knowledge, add self-control, And to that, add patient endurance. Not your favorite list. I get that. But it's a good list. Right? So once you have self-control, you also need patient endurance. And to patient endurance, godliness. And to godliness, godliness, brotherly affection, which is the phileo love, which is the familial love. Yes, we're actually supposed to love each other in an emotional sense. We're supposed to like each other. How many times do Christians say, oh, I love you in the Lord, but I don't really like you right now? Okay, they're leaving phileo love out. You're actually, let your heart catch up to your reality, right? God wants you to have brotherly affection. And again, affection that is, that is not affection with a sexual connotation. It's just the affection that we have for each other. Our culture is starving for this right now because of, I don't know, pandemic or something. Okay. And to your patient endurance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, love for everyone. And that word is agape, which is the kind of love Jesus talks about. Jesus' kind of love is what we're all supposed to do. So the people say, well, that's too hard. Well, back up, back up, back up. Work on the parts of it and then build an amazing life. It's all in response to what? The promises of God. Why should we do this? Because God has promised us certain things, and if we do our part, it has amazing results. Anybody not see that that being that kind of person that has all those traits would make you amazing? Yes, wouldn't you love to have that person for your boss? So would the people that work for you. Okay, just, just, just saying. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody here like to be productive? When I was young, I thought I just liked to be busy, and I realized being busy is not very fulfilling for me, right? I still am a busy person, but I'm busy because I want to be productive. If I've been busy all day and not productive, eh, that's a bad day. If I've had my feet up most of the day, but it was a productive day, I don't really care how busy I am. I am, I do care how productive I've been. So if you're like me, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you're going to be in Jesus. But those who fail to develop in this way. So if there's anything in your mind saying, okay, nice message, man, but in five minutes, I'm going to be out of here and I don't have to do any of this. This is his warning to all of us. Those who fail to develop in this way. And you don't, okay. Our culture right now is enamored with people that are just naturally good at whatever they do. We don't want to have to develop. We just want to be fully done. And that's what we think is amazing. 
there are many today, if they, don't, if they show up to the job and they can't just do it all, they're, they're just disappointed in their performance. And, and they're not, if you don't have a job that it takes you a while to develop your ability to do it, you will be bored in about a week or less. You need to develop. So if you fail to develop in this way, you are short-sighted and blind. Jesus said the number, his prognosis for the human condition, they're blind and hard-hearted. They're blind because they're hard-hearted and they are hard-hearted because they're blind. And it's just this awful loop that people get stuck in. And he says, if you don't pay attention to what he just shared with us, you're going to end up in that loop. And that's a very unproductive place to be. They are short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. The point is, we're different. And now we have a capacity for being amazing in Jesus. But again, not amazing on our own. We don't show up amazing. We are amazing as we become a conduit for the Spirit of God flowing through our life. That's what makes us amazing. Verse 10. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard. I grew up in a family that has a high value for hard work. Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things. He doesn't say know these things. He says what? Do these things. And you will never fall away. For those of you that eternal security is really an important doctrine for you, you really have to listen to what he says right here. Because he's saying, you, you want eternal security? Put it in gear. Work hard to be the person God has called you to be. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is a massive promise. God promises us eternity with him. And what he asks of us now is that we allow him to change who we are from the inside out. That we'd stop cutting corners and we start being the real deal. That's all he's asking of us. Just be the real deal. And it will change our life and it will change. We will become a gift to all the people in our life because that is a great person to be with. So your assignment this week, say what you see. To be able to do that, what do you have to do first? See. You have to be looking. So look for ways this week to see other people living amazing lives in Jesus and then don't be shy. Say what you see. If you're super courageous, send me a video talking about it. That would be a great week. Let's pray. Lord God, you have called us to wake up, to be amazing, and to do that for the rest of our days. Today, as we, as we go into the Christmas season, as we look at all the gifts that we'll be giving, and literally more than a million gifts our neighbors are going to give each other this year. If you just take Southeast Orlando and then do the math, there will be over a million gifts given out in Southeast Orlando. But the gifts that matter are the ones that you give us. They're the ones that empower us to become the people you've called us to be. So help us to be your children, to reflect you this Christmas season, and to allow ourselves to be a gift to all those we come in contact with. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.